in pregnancy, one of the most common discomforts that people experience are musculoskeletal. So um, that's our specialty. We work on taking muscles that are muscles, soft tissue in general, muscles, tendons, fascia, that's too stiff, tight, rigid, pulling on things that shouldn't be pulled on, compressing things that shouldn't be compressed, and releasing that restriction in the soft tissue and bones where they come together to form joints and there should be good mobility there. If there isn't, we do little adjustments and get the bones moving better. When you have a better functioning musculoskeletal system, you're prone to have a more comfortable, functional pregnancy experience that you enjoy and that your body is at its best capacity to accommodate everything the baby needs, uh, both during the pregnancy, leading up to the birth, during the birth, and for postpartum recoveries. Today's guest, Elliot Berlin, he's a chiropractor living in LA. I met him at a lunchtime talk, very pretty casual lunchtime talk at my residency training program at Kaiser in LA, great program. And they're great because they would bring in really, really interesting speakers to talk about things that are otherwise not appreciated very well in the OBGYN training process. So Elliot came in and screened a film and he produced this film as well. It's called Heads Up, The Disappearing Art of Vaginal Breach Delivery. And there were a couple interesting faces in the crowd. First was Emiliano Chavira, who was an MFM who used to work in that department and then left and went into uh, to work at another hospital system in LA. He remained a good friend and mentor. He's come to the, the Twins Breach Conference that I held in 2023. He's coming, hopefully coming back as an attendee in 2024. Um, he was sitting right across from me and he, he's become a good friend of mine because he's very, very critical of what has become pretty dogmatic in the training of OBGYNs, particularly what are the downsides of not <laughs> offering a woman the opportunity to give birth vaginally when her baby is butt down? After all, three to 4% of babies at term are butt down. So if we're just automatically going to say we don't have those skills and we're going to tell you you have to have a C-section, that doesn't make us very expert. It's sort of like a, a, an airplane pilot saying, hey, I'm pretty good at flying uh, you know, a, a Boeing 747, except for 4% of the time, right? You're not an expert flying an airplane if you can't manage everything that might arise and, and call on your skills as an expert um, pilot. The same goes for uh, breech birth, and so that brings up another individual who was in that uh, in that crowd the day that day. I had never met him, but his name's Stuart Fishbein. He has a great podcast as well called Birthing Instincts with his um, companion midwife um, Bliss Young. He was sitting there as well, and and he and Elliot have worked together quite a bit on trying to destigmatize the notion that um, vaginal breech birth is unsafe, right? When we look at the metrics, yeah, when we're not training people to do vaginal breech birth, of course, when dystocias or maneuvers are required to relieve dystocias, if you're not trained to do that, yeah, it is unsafe. But why did we stop teaching people in the first place? And Elliot is a part of this vanguard of really, really conscious practitioners, even from a chiropractor's lens. He's also a doula, by the way, um, on, on the importance of, of continuing to train doctors to do this, you know, because at the end of the day, you cannot be compelled to have a C-section unless you consent. And informed consent requires that you're provided the risks, benefits, alternatives to a C-section as well as a vaginal breech birth so that you can make an informed decision. But if I can't even offer you the opportunity to try a vaginal breech birth, then I can't really do my job. And Dr. Fishbein has been very, very critical to my um, educational process for me to appreciate that if I wanna be the best, I have to learn from the best. And Stu Fishbein, Milo Chavira, a variety of my other attendings as well, but also Elliot Berlin, my guest today, was very, very critical in helping me become who I am today as a man, as a husband, as a birth attendant, and really as a support person to midwives around the country. So Elliot um, screened this film. It got my wheels turning. I started going to home births with Dr. Fishbein, and I found myself doing now what I am doing about 10 years later. 
um, and feeling very fortunate that I pursued breach training. But it was this film that really captured my attention. There's a there's a scene in the film that Elliot describes in this interview where you show a hospital, um, like a cesarean in the hospital versus a home birth. And really this contrast is what really captured my attention. And we talk about that, some of the reflections that we were all collectively kind of, um, uh, I don't know, the wheels were turning, some of our reflections that were that were offered into this community space. And frankly, a lot of the other people in the room were not as, um, it didn't capture their hearts the way that it did for me. But I want you to go and watch the film. It's at informedpregnancy.tv, which is actually an app you can get on like Fire Stick and everything. There's a variety of other resources there, including work from like Natalie Headings, who's a, a personal trainer and she works on the pelvic floor and diastasis recti and, and sort of the exercise piece from preconception all the way through postpartum. Um, there's a lot of other resources there. So that's where you can find Elliot and his work, including Heads Up, The Disappearing Art of Vaginal Breach Birth. He has other films, he has other projects. I just want you to go and check out his work because once you hear this conversation, you're going to be hopefully as enthralled as I was when I met Elliot um, right from the beginning, early in my career. So in order to um, keep the lights on here, of course, we have a couple of sponsors. The first is Immune Intel AHCC. This is a, um, a product made, it's a whole food supplement made from the mycelia of shiitake mushroom. It's been clinically demonstrated to help women clear persistent HPV, along with a variety of other conditions that we don't have many answers to. And given that this is coming from the world of fungi and the interconnectedness that fungi play, um, these mycelial networks that, that kind of um, connect every part of our ecosystem together, it's no surprise that it also helps to balance this connectivity between our immune cells in order to get immune dysregulation back on track so that your immune system can operate fully. And a big part of clearing HPV and preventing cancer is to have a, a, an optimally functioning um, nervous system and immune system and gut. So this product was so compelling to me that, and I saw it working for so many of my clients that Mimi and I actually also teamed up and created a program called Clear and Free, your holistic solution to persistent HPV, which comes with direct support from me and Mimi um, along your um, health optimization journey, especially if you're worried about well, you know the results of your, your um, cervical cancer screenings, like your pap smear or your HPV screen. Um, frankly, the OBGYNs are not providing a lot of options while you're awaiting that repeat screen or the colposcopic biopsy or even an excisional procedure like LEAP or a cold knife cone or even an escharotic therapy, which is starting to become a, a, an increasingly compelling alternative to those things. But frankly, you know, even if you do end up with a leap or a cold knife cone or escharotic therapy, it doesn't fix whatever was going on upstream. And that's where Clear and Free really tries to fill those gaps. I was frustrated as an OBGYN, you know, a young OBGYN, not being able to, um, not really having the time or the incentives to educate people on how lifestyle and what you're eating, how you're moving, how you're sleeping, um, what supplements can be helpful you know, to be operating at my at, at your best, I I wasn't com I wasn't given the time or really the education to offer that to my clients. And so, of course, six months later, when they come in for a repeat screen, nothing has changed on their PAP, on their HPV. Their biopsy shows that they've got you know maybe aggressive or or let's say progressive SIN, the SIN two or SIN three, that cervical intraepithelial neoplasia. And all of this is so mystified because us OBGYNs don't do a great job of educating. So this program, Clear and Free, fills the gaps. And directed supplementation with a product like Immune Intel HCC is a mainstay of my therapy for anybody who's dealing with a variety of immune dysregulatory issues, including autoimmune conditions like Hashimoto's, including persi persistent HPV, and even um, people who um, find themselves at higher risk of developing a variety of cancers. So all of that is uh, can, can be found at clearhpv.com. But if you want to try this product alone, I, they're a, a gracious um, sponsor, and I'm very grateful to have them. Um, I don't align myself with many brands any longer, but Immune Intel is one of them. If you want to try their product, go to immune, um, sorry, themedicine.com. That's T-H-E-M-E-D-I-C-I-N.com. You can um, pick up a bottle there and you can get 10% off if you use code BELOVED10. We have one other sponsor, which is We Natal. Of all of the prenatal vitamins out there, this is the one I'm recommending to all of my clients. I actually take this as a multivitamin for myself, which is really lovely. And um, the reason I like We Natal is instead of taking 10 capsules per day, you can only take 
three to four capsules per day, um, which is easy, especially easier than 10, of course, especially if you have some early nausea in your pregnancy. And if you're really looking for the optimal nutrition, there are a couple companies out there that do it, but not like we natal does it because we natal is, is doing all of this in three capsules. And that makes it a lot easier to stay on this as an insurance policy to an already healthy lifestyle. You know, I have this other program that I built with Sarah Rosser called Born Free Method. You can go to bornfreemethod.com to learn more. And we're adding a bunch of content to that. And um, a big focus of the program is how do you nourish yourself physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually from preconception all the way through postpartum. And companies like We Natal take the burden off of me to make sure that you're getting all of your adequate nutrition, like vitamin D, like folate, not folic acid, but folate, like choline. Um, this is providing you assurance that you're you're optimally nourishing your baby and yourself as you're going through this really, really hard process of growing a baby and building your family. Um, they're also very eco-conscious. You know, they'll send you these glass jars and then every month they'll send you a sleeve to refill those jars using a um, um, the very, very minimal packaging. And I love that. They also will send you a journal to be documenting what's going on with your physical, mental, emotional, and even spiritual well-being throughout this journey so that you can feel complete and whole and prepared. And of course, the Born Free Method is the way to get all of the information and support that you need. In that program, we include um, 12 months of weekly calls. Um, you get direct support from me and a radical midwife, <laughs> Sarah Rosser. She's a total badass and I love her. She's my best friend. Um, you get all of that. So bornfreemethod.com is where you can um, get more information about that program that I've built with Sarah. If you want to try WeNatal's products um, separate from Born Free, of course, you can go to WeNatal.com. Use code BELOVED. And when you make any prenatal product purchase, you can add a bottle of Omega DHA Plus, which is the only other product that they make. They make a his vitamin, a her vitamin, and they make a fish oil. Add that to your cart and it's going to be free. Your first bottle will be free. So go to WeNatal.com. Support these, support these guys. They're so small and they're so conscious in how they... Um, they operate in the world, and that's why I'm so grateful to have them here as a sponsor of the show. Again, guys, if anything in this conversation or anywhere else in the holistic OBGYN um, universe captures you, if you get any value from it, let us know that you're listening by sharing it with your friends. Go and leave a five-star review. It takes 15 seconds, and it really matters so much to me. I am so grateful when I see another review come in, and if um, and so that's a way of just getting these conversations out to more people, getting Elliot Berlin's um, insights as a chiropractor and doula um, and an advocate for vaginal breech birth, getting it out to the world. The more that we're talking about this, the more that we're circulating this, the more that other people will be able to support you as well. So send these conversations to your friends and family whenever they feel you know, uncertain around your decisions so you can feel totally supported. But it, really at the end of the day, this is a matter of you feeling like you're fully informed around vaginal breech birth and you're able to understand those risks and benefits when compared to you know repeats, multiple repeat C-sections. That's a really, really important um, nugget to take from this conversation. Um, Elliot Berlin is here. I want to get right into that conversation. His website is Informed Pregnancy dot com or informedpregnancy.tv if you want to screen the film, if you want to see any of the other incredible resources that Elliot has put into the world. I'm very, very grateful for this man. And I think you will be too. Dr. Berlin, welcome to my podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It is, um, it's a pleasure to see you for the second time in no longer than a week. And um, prior to that, we hadn't seen each other since you had come to speak at a lunchtime talk at Kaiser when I was a, a little baby resident. And uh, <laughs> it's because you have face blindness, maybe you can tell us about that. You probably don't recognize my <laughs> face, but you definitely remembered my name. So. Um, so welcome. How, how uh, what has evolved? You know, so so the reason you came to that to that talk. Well, let me let me start here. Let me actually take a couple steps backward. I have far more chiropractors that I'm getting along with than OBGYNs nowadays. Well, like, why are chiropractors so invested in the pregnancy and postpartum care? 
maybe it's something that we're doing and kind of like teeing it up where you guys have to fix what we've done wrong. Like I'm open to any suggestion here, but why are chiropractors doing such good work in the prenatal space? Well, first of all, thank you. Um, and also twice a week is fine with me. I'd, I'd see you four times a week, uh, even if it means having to get knocked up. I will try my best. <laughs> you know what? That's going to um, be my next research project. We're going to get Dr. Berlin. Um, I'm going to be your, your OBGYN. <laughs> I would love it. Um, and uh, yeah, if you get pregnant, I'll be your chiropractor. So Okay, perfect. We'll trade. <laughs> what's the deal with chiropractic and pregnancy? You know, the the idea, I think, of allopathic medicine and holistic medicine, the real, one of the major differences today is the is built into the name, holistic, right? So allopathic medicine, I kind of think back to a time when uh, if you had an issue medically, you'd call the doctor and they'd come over on the horse with a little black bag and inside there, there was probably, I don't know, uh, aspirin and alcohol and a thermometer. And uh, the thermometer told you if you're going to live or not, and the aspirin and alcohol kept you comfortable until it happened. Uh, things have changed. Medicine has changed a lot. A lot of innovation and technology, which is wonderful, incredible. Um, but that also means that uh, now so much the doctor doesn't really come to you. We, we go to the doctor. And also, uh, it means that there's a lot of narrowing down and specializing within the field of medicine. So allopathic medicine, the sort of medicine of, in, in drugs and surgery approach, it's sort of, you know, you, you don't just even have a bone doctor and a lung doctor and a heart doctor. And a, now the bone doctors are like, are, are you upper Femur body or lower body? <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, exactly. And then it's down to just, okay, so, elbow down. And then, and I, I mean, we really literally have a thumb specialist here. Yeah. So yeah. it's becoming more micro focused and holistic medicine is the opposite. We kind of zoom out and look at the whole organism as one, you know, all the systems yeah. involved. Um, and not just the, the physical systems, but mind, body, and spirit as one. Um, yeah. And I think there's value to both. I think when the two come together, we, we offer the best complementary care that a person can receive. Uh, but, you know, with chiropractors, we look at everything holistically. We look at pediatrics holistically. We look at sports holistically. We look at pregnancy holistically. We look at geriatrics holistically. So the idea of holistic, even when you have symptoms, is that um, I, I remember in school, they always used to say, when you step on a dog's tail, it barks, you know. And so if the issue, if the complaint, if the symptom is the barking, then um, it, uh, the allopathic approach might be to look at the vocal cords and figure out how we can remove them or anesthetize them, um, but there's still going to be a foot on the dog's tail. And the holistic approach zooms out and says, oh, look, there's a foot in the dog's tail. Let's take that off. Um, and I think that during pregnancy, the more allopathic we get, the more specialized and localized and zooming in on let's measure, you know, from here to here and pee in this cup and let's say, you know, um, and, and to the kind of forgetting of the the whole organism um, or overlooking it or not addressing it um, is something that uh, is to the detriment of healthy pregnancy, birth, and postpartum. Um, yeah. And that's on top of, of the loss of the village. Like a lot of those things used to be maybe supplemented by the fact that you lived with your family on family properties and you had your village around you supporting you in that way. So on the one hand, we lost that from the village because most of us don't live that way anymore. And we also lost it from our, our practitioners, our medical practitioners, as we become more and more focused and localized and, and zoomed in on a specialty. So uh, I think that holistic practitioners in general are, are filling that void where when somebody comes into my office, uh, I don't just see a bump. I see uh, a person with a, uh, another person inside them. And um, I'm asking all the time about, you know, how are you feeling head to toe? What's your stress level? Are you, are you eating while well? you're getting exercise? How's your relationship? Um, just everything. But, you know, in pregnancy, one of the most common discomforts that people experience are musculoskeletal. So, 
um, that's our specialty. We work on taking yeah. muscles that are, are muscles, soft tissue in general, muscles, tendons, fascia that's too stiff, tight, rigid, pulling on things that shouldn't be pulled on, compressing things that shouldn't be compressed, and releasing that restriction in the soft tissue and bones where they come together to form joints and there should be good mobility there. If there isn't, we do little adjustments and get the bones moving better. When you have a better functioning musculoskeletal system, you're prone to have a more comfortable, functional pregnancy experience that you enjoy and that your body is at its best capacity to accommodate everything the baby needs, uh, both during the pregnancy, leading up to the birth, during the birth, and for postpartum recovery. So I think that's why we're, um, you know, striking it big with the pregnant population. Yeah, you know what comes to mind? I'm reading this book by Peter Atia, who's probably not a very nice guy, but he's a very smart guy. And I actually think he dropped out of residency, maybe a surgical oncology residency at Stanford, if I if I recall, but or maybe Hopkins. I don't know. It's an Ivy League, whatever. And um, he wrote this book called Outlive, and he was talking about the tactics versus strategies of the healthcare professions. And I think that what you're describing here, and 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 even and Sun Tzu, who wrote The Art of War, you know, this is a an allegory for war, but I think it also is a really appropriate um, uh, concept to remember in healthcare, which is strategies and tactics are actually very, very different. So the way that um, Sun Tzu described it was strategy without tactic is the slowest route to victory. And I think all of the things that we doctors, the allopathic doctors learn are very tactical but the general strategy and approach to health has to be, a, a, you know, have to take a step back and consider the whole picture. An example of this would be the rumble in the jungle back in what was that, the 70s between Ali and Foreman. Foreman was the heavyweight, you know, boxing title holder and Ali was coming back and wanted to take it. But we got like the biggest, meanest, strongest hitter in boxing and Ali coming in with more experience, his tactics could have been let's just go you like punch each other in the face until somebody falls down and that's going to be a losing battle or do i tire this giant strong guy out and just dance around and make him throw more punches than me and wear him out and then i can f throw the big final blow in the eighth round and, and take the title back had he gone in just tactically similar with the dog example he wouldn't have been able to come out a victor but because he had a strategy now we're talking and um, and so your approach as a chiropractor, what I'm learning from a lot of chiropractors is the strategy that is sort of implemented through the lens of chiropractics and many other holistic modalities outside of allopathic medicine tend to have quite a bit of, of um, gusto. You know, they, they tend to work well. So, so it's no surprise, I think, that women are going and finding people like you in the chiropractic space. And, and you know, there's a lot of chiropractors that I, I've met over the years. Lindsay Kant, who's another one who... I just find her so endearing. Like she really knows what she's doing, and she's also bringing in a lot of exercise and nutrition and and everything else. Um, but we are going to get into some tactics because I think there are. My wife certainly has gone to the chiropractor during and after pregnancy. Our kids have gone to the chiropractor, so maybe we can talk about some of those tactics. Um, but first, I, I want to also. I, I think I'd be remiss to not bring up the film that you screened at that that fateful day when I met you at Kaiser. Um, Tell us about the film. Are you still screening um, um, Heads Up? Are you still screening that film? Or is that something now that people have to go onto your website to find? Uh, uh, all good questions. So, you know, I'm not really, although becoming more of one, not really a filmmaker. Uh, I Everything media-oriented that I do started from from the fact that patients had questions that I didn't have answers to. I did a lot of research. I still do all the time research for my patients. Anybody can do research. Uh, it's going to take a little bit of time and effort and sorting out fact and uh, compiling it into a way that you can deliver it in digestible forms. So at first, uh, you know, I, I also, by the way, I come from a pretty medical background. So um, I worked in ambulances and emergency rooms starting from the time I was 18. I did EMT training in New York City when I was 17. Um, and I worked in, in hospitals and ambulances, and I thought, oh, this is the greatest thing ever. And, you know, in emergency, uh, allopathic is it rocks. You know, if you've got a, a, a impaled lung, it's not a great time for a chiropractic adjustment or, you know, a massage. 
Um, and I think I think all the modalities and all the forms of healthcare that we have have uh, you know a, an area where they are for sure the clear winner um, and the gold standard, and other ones where we overlap. And uh, in general, that's why I think that the complementary approach to care. Um, when we can work together and give the best of what we have and the best of what you have to our patients, that's when they get get the best experience and the best results. Um, so I come from a medical background, and I thought uh, I'd for sure be the greatest something surgeon ever. My father, when I was nineteen, on my way to medical school, um, you know, pre med, uh, he just suddenly died partially from a medical mix up. And uh, it kind of set me on a path. I, I, I still wanted to do healthcare. I always have since I was a little kid. Um, and uh, I just didn't want to be in the drugs and surgery space. I respect it. I love it. I appreciate it. I, I utilize it when I need it for myself. I certainly recommend it when my patients need it. But I didn't want to be in that area. So I took a year off after college. Uh, I, I worked at a pizza shop making pizza and uh, spent the nights really studying what, what other forms of healthcare are there that interest me, that yeah. I, I think I can, I can serve people with. And I fell in love with the combination of chiropractic and massage. I went to school separately for both, smushed them together to make the peanut butter and chocolate of holistic <laughs> healthcare. Uh, and, you know, and then sort of the pregnancy work came in when my wife and I struggled hard with fertility. We spent three years doing everything under the sun medically to try to get uh, pregnant. They told us we never could and never would, although they did not know why. They just exhausted all the options. And, um, you know, we spent nine months getting healthy so we can adopt a baby and then found out we were pregnant. So uh, it, it just... Uh, <laughs> It wasn't like we took a holistic approach to getting pregnant. We just took a holistic approach to getting healthy, mentally, physically, relationship, financially healthy. And uh, the babies just started coming. And uh, every two years, another kid popped out like we couldn't. Turn it off. <laughs> <laughs> you have four, four yeah. teenagers now, right? Four teenagers, yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll definitely be highlighting um, some of the the, the child related child development related stuff that you um can probably bring some personal touches to in that conversation um tell me about yes. uh yeah yeah so so let's talk so a film, little bit about the film yeah the film came came along just you know i had all these questions like could, can you help me find a doctor who can do we'll do a vaginal birth after cesarean for me like why what what why can any doctor do a vaginal birth after cesarean review? And I, you know, the more you research, the more you find out the the details involved, and and just try to present. You know, these are the pros and cons as as I understand them. And this is not everything that um, a doctor will or won't do is solely based on what's best for you. So you might really have to dig out a doctor who's in line with your wishes and goals, and and you might have to put in a lot more than you really should or thought you would um, in terms of uh, going out of your network or sometimes traveling far distances to be able to get the support you want. But the more I found out, the more I was answering these questions again and again, and I tried to figure out ways to disseminate them to a, a general wider audience to help give them the information and empowerment that comes along with that to make choices and, and be supported in those choices. And, you know, along the way, we've, we've done a magazine, we've done a blog that we still have, we've done a podcast that we still have, and then I produced the two movies, Heads Up, The Disappearing Art of Vaginal Breach Delivery, and Trial of Labor, which is about vaginal birth after cesarean. And um, Heads Up was really important to me because a lot of people came in and uh, had breech babies and did not want to have surgery. Uh, some of them already had, let's say, two babies that were born vaginally, you know, healthy weights, no no complications and now all of a sudden they have a frank breech baby and the only option they're being given is to have a cesarean birth and from all the research i did that just didn't make any sense and yeah. uh, there are only a couple of doctors left in this town anyway that were were still midwives were were not allowed to deliver breech babies anymore by scope of practice narrowing uh legally and then um the OBs that knew how weren't really doing it and uh, nobody else was being trained on it. So we're down to a couple of uh, old timers essentially. And uh, I just, I, I don't think I, you know, I sometimes don't think that, that even the medical doctors get the, 
emotional story that's involved or, yeah. you know, sometimes see the person behind, you know, if I was a plumber, I could do whatever I want to that sink. Um, but with a person, sometimes you think that way as a technician and you lose sight of the fact that there's a whole person behind this with so much more involved. And, and sometimes it's really important to them. And sometimes the option really, um, you know, actually even medically statistically would be in their favor to, to do that vaginal birth with a breech baby um yet the option was disappearing so we made the film we were doing screenings all over the place it was very well received um overall and uh, so a couple of doctors that i didn't even know attended breech birth kind of popped to the surface and um uh, and got very busy from the film itself and um you know the that film and Trial of Labor about VMAC both made a big splash when they came out and then both sort of started to fizzle in terms of uh, who was watching it and the impact they could have. And I learned that that happens to a lot of films, especially in, in this space, the birth space, even even iconic films like The Business of Being Born. Uh, and that's what prompted me to put together a streaming site where we gather as many of these films and other types of video content that that are appropriate, that are informative and and educational and empowering, sometimes entertaining, and uh, put them all in one space where anybody who has an internet connection can access them. We made them extremely affordable. And uh, that's that's where Informed Pregnancy Plus came in. So now, actually, through your efforts and Dr. Stu and others who are sort of really fueling the fire of don't take away this option from us, this breech birth option. Uh, people from all over the world are, are because you can see where people are, are renting from, streaming from, and uh, it, all over the world are watching Heads Up, and it's having, um, on, on this platform now, it's having a bigger impact than it's had over the past two or three years. So um, it's, uh, it's a cause in motion that is gaining momentum, I think, albeit painfully slowly. And um, hopefully we'll ignite more more interest and more training and more accessibility to both breach yeah. for people who want it and uh, VMAC for people who want it. Your, um, your website and both your streaming site, which is here, well, let's maybe pop it up here. If you guys that aren't watching on YouTube, we, we will put all of the links here in the show description. But if you're watching on YouTube, you're going to see it right here on the screen. Informedpregnancy.tv is the streaming site. And of course, Dr. Berlin's website and blog is informedpregnancy.com. But that word informed, that's actually capturing my attention. And I think uh, sort of the other word that comes with informed consent, let's say, is this word allow or permission. And for me, as a young doctor, when I was still in residency, I'm still a young guy, but now it seems like I've been doing this for a long time now. <laughs> and I, I guess that's like what age does to you. You just don't even realize how long you've been beating your head against the wall. And one thing, despite my advocacy and how I show up in interviews and how I, you know, the guests that I bring on and the conversations on this podcast, people are still surprised that I, listen to this carefully, allow women to give birth breach. How does that sound to you? Because for me, it, ru it ruffles my feathers every time. So that, that's a little hint as to how I'm feeling. But when, you know, you didn't say like, allowed pregnancy or permitted pregnancy or whatever. So, so what is this issue with informed consent and this permission slip that so many people think that they must be vested by somebody who's in a white coat in order to exercise their autonomy? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a great point. And as a doula, I spent many years as a doula. Um, that, He's that a doula that too, making... guys. He's also a doula. <laughs> <laughs> Doodla dude, 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 blah, something. Dude blah. Dude blah. Anyway, <laughs> so um, yeah, as a doula observing birth in a lot of different settings, at home, at birth centers, at hospitals, with OBs, with midwives, there's there's so many choices now. Um, but that informed idea becomes clearer and clearer every time. Um, you know, somebody once asked me, "What's really the big difference between a home birth and a hospital birth?" And well, who cares which building you're in? I'm like, it has nothing to do with the building. It's it's at a hospital, you generally check your autonomy at the door when you walk in. And the setting that's that that's created is one that makes you feel like 
you work for everybody there. They're going to tell you what, what to do and what not to do, what you can do, what you can't do. And like you said, you need permission for anything. May I go use the bathroom? Um, can I eat this? Can I walk around? Can I, can I wear this? Um, whereas at home, it's the exact opposite. You do whatever you want and, and everybody's there to support you. And of course you're being monitored, you know, for safety and health. Um, and maybe not in exactly the same way, but sometimes maybe in a more efficient sometimes way, better. a better way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, uh, it, you know, that's, that's the difference. It's, it's, if anybody's asking for permission, it's the people around you saying, Hey, do you mind if we use this towel, you know, uh, things like that. And so, the informed piece is, is huge. And for me, informed doesn't mean like, oh, oh you know, you, know. You, you have a breached baby, you need to have a, a vaginal birth. It's not like that at all. It's here's the information. I love when people watch Heads Up and decide that vaginal birth with their breech baby is not for them. And I love when people want. That is Heads beautiful. And, Thank you. Say that again. Say it's like really clarify what you're saying. You're, you're not telling love, people what they should or shouldn't do. Like the purpose of the film is that's not your job or my job. So go ahead. I, I love where you're going with this. <laughs> I, I just, I recommend people watch. If you have a breech baby, I recommend you watch the film. And I'm, some people come out of it absolutely sure that they do not want to have a vaginal breech birth. And some people come out fairly sure that they do. Um, but then once you have that information, once you have that perspective, you can go try to find practitioners who will, who will back it up for you. So that's the whole idea of informed. It's not, it's not me telling you what you should do or what you have to do. Certainly. Um, it's me telling you what the possibilities are and as we know them, the pros and cons. And, uh, I, you know, I mentioned this when you were on my podcast, but one of the things I absolutely was knocked over by when we did that screening in your residency, uh, was you bring up the idea like, wait a second. So vaginal breach delivery is, is an option, even according to ACOG, it's still, uh, could be a great option for people if there are practitioners that you find who are trained and comfortable doing it and with certain criteria, safety criteria. So since the residency you were doing, that hospital didn't offer it, that network didn't offer it, you said, isn't it our obligation, our duty to say, well, with your breech baby, our only option is to do a cesarean birth, but there are providers in town who offer vaginal breach delivery, if that's something of interest to you to explore. And it created like this major conversation with, you know, with kind of sparks and fireworks where people are like, well, vaginal birth is not a necessary procedure. Um, and, you know, maybe it is to that person. I, 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 you know, on a bigger level, VBAC blows my mind. The idea, VBAC is yeah. the absence of a procedure. Right. For you to be able to say, oh, no, you can't have your baby without this procedure. All I'm asking is uh, just let me that. go into labor and give birth. And let uh, me have a baby. The, let me have a baby. Get out of the way. And let me have a baby. And fortunately, you're there in, in case we need you. But let me have, try to avoid that altogether. <laughs> and then what happens is you start to get this reputation as, oh, he's anti-medicine, he's anti-intervention, he's anti-C-section. I can tell you how many times I'm the one saying, you know, I really think an epidural right now is going to help you open up and bring this baby out. And your cervix is swelling. And if you keep not being able to not push or strain, your cervix is going to swell all the way up. And I don't think you'll have a choice other than a cesarean birth. That epidural is going to be great for you. Um, a yeah. therapeutic rest right now could be amazing for you. And as sometimes as c-section you know i always say the the only thing worse than somebody who doesn't want or doesn't need a cesarean birth who's pushed into one is someone who needs one and doesn't have access to one um, they're great tools they're incredible modalities and they're marvels of medicine i'm glad that we have them the only reason i become the you know the guy who's like helping people have more natural birth is because there's so much push against people having natural birth. I've advocated for people to have a cesarean. Uh, uh, it's not that common that someone can't get access to one if they want one, but I had a patient who had severe, um, psychological resistance to wanting to have a vaginal birth. Her mother had a vaginal birth with complications that she lived with her whole life. Um, it, you know, aside from the guilt of sort of having, feeling like she caused those complications for her mother her whole life, um, the oh fear God. of having them herself. Um, she's young, strong, healthy, probably best candidate on the world for an amazing vaginal birth. Um, but from a psychological perspective, she didn't want one. And uh, her doctor was really pushing her, you know, to not 
to not do the C-section. It's like, I, I really can't justify doing surgery on you, which I get. But yeah. at the same time, it's an informed choice. She gets the pros and cons. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's all any doctor, anybody who has the word doctor in front of them that offers some kind of modalities or procedures, really, that's our job is to educate and inform. These are your choices. These are the pros and cons as we know them. What would you like to do? Yeah. And that's why yeah. all the media, all the films and, and uh, podcasts and things like that. And, and look, here you are, um, the holistic OBGYN um, and... And if you can open a medical school, <laughs> uh, <laughs> what what a better place the world will be for uh, for pregnancy, birth, and postpartum. Well, the one issue with with opening a medical school, Elliot, I've considered it. You know, I've I've been collecting my pennies and nickels under the couch, and uh, uh, frankly. I'm not certain I could afford it because even my my own home institution, I can't remember how much money it was, but it was somewhere in the tens of millions, you know, that were contributed by pharmaceutical companies in order to help support our education. And of course, that comes with some some downsides, right? Whenever you have corporate, you know, investment. So I'd have to get Dr. Berlin and Bliss and Stu and all these other awesome podcasters. We'd have to pool our money, and then I'll open a medical school and I'll 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 sit back as a, a silent deity in the background and you guys can cr create the curriculum because I still consider you guys mentors to me and I'm still learning. I mean, this, this whole practice thing is like, at what point do you feel like you're an expert? A lot of people like to use this word expert, but I don't even like using that word because I'm learning something new every day. Here, listen to this. There's an Amish woman who's got her ninth pregnancy and her first four were C-sections, the third of which was a classical incision. And that's up and down on the uterus. So we know that that's a higher risk of rupturing since we're talking about, you know, trial of labor after C-section. And then she went on to have three successful home births after that. So when we try to apply our lens of informed, uh, whatever, not informed, evidence-based medicine, if you don't have a study that says that it's it's okay to do this thing, then we're not going to even admit it. We're not going, there's that allow, that permission word again. But how would you fit this woman into that data set? She's had four C-sections, one of which was classical, and then she went on to have three completely beautiful, uncomplicated VBACs at home. So am I going to support her? Hell yeah, I'm going to support her because she knows that there's. she's been through this conversation over and over and over, and she has now shown that despite what that – curve you know this data set has shown us that she's actually more likely to have a to be to be kept safe and to co-regulate with her baby right afterwards which is the next topic of our conversation by the way she knows from experience that that is more likely to happen again so when we talk about evidence-based medicine we have to take the story that you mentioned um, you have to take the practitioner's experience which is why i still consider myself a mentee to so many people like dr Stu, where i'm still learning the, the nuances, and, and Christine Laurie and a lot of other midwives, the nuances of vaginal breech birth and, and whatnot. Um, and then you also take the data from the clinical trials and you put that together into some sort of support system so that this person feels held. And that's, I agree with you, that is really our job. Um, anything you want to say there? Because I want to talk about the childbirth experience and how it sets the path forward for you know people and their children to feel some sense of autonomy over their own bodies in the future. Hey guys, it's Nathan. Wanted to uh, interrupt this amazing conversation very briefly to talk to you, um, specifically if you're a birth worker. Um, this goes for doulas, childbirth educators, midwives of all sorts, whether you're out of hospital or in hospital, and especially the OBGYNs, the family medicine docs, those of you who are attending to births. I want you to ask yourself, if a person rolls into your practice and they're in labor and there's a bud emerging from the vagina, what are you going to do? What I was taught to do was let's rush you to the operating room. Forget about informed consent. We have to do this through the abdomen. We have to do a C-section because the baby is breech. But frankly, I think a lot of women, rightfully so, want to avoid C-section, you know, unnecessarily, of course. And so if you were to just rely on your, let's say your OBGYN residency training, you're not going to have the skills to attend to a breech birth. The good news is most breech babies come out without any intervention at all. 
that in the rare chance that they have a nuchal arm or a hyperextended neck or whatever, you want to have those skills. And it requires practice on practice on practice to get those skills, which is why I started hosting an annual conference here in Louisville. And in 2024, we're going to be leveling up this entire program. This is the 2024 Born Free Twins Breach Conference, where you're going to be able to get plenty of simulator experience uh, with very, very well-trained educators and instructors. You're going to hear from a variety of midwives and some doctors. Um, this year, we're featuring the Spinning Babies team, Breach Without Borders team. Stu Fishbine's going to be there. Christine Laria is coming with the Breach Without Borders team. She was a recent addition. Um, Carol Gauchi from the Pacific Northwest is coming. Um, we're also bringing two keynote speakers, Machila Motse, who's a new, newly crowned PhD from uh, South Africa, as well as Doña Angelina Martinez Miranda from Cuernavaca, Mexico is coming. These are instructors that have quite a bit, uh, a breadth of, uh, of knowledge and experience in order to help round out your own education. I haven't even mentioned um, Tracy Vogel, who's an OB anesthesiologist. She's going to be coming in to talk about trauma-informed care. Hermine Hayes-Klein is coming to speak to informed consent. There is so much that we're offering here. And I've only gotten to the like didactics part. There's going to be plenty of time to practice on, on, on very realistic uh, mannequins. And there are going to be some other activities for you to do some healing and as a means of community building. So we're going to do some trauma release work, um, a musical odyssey with Rebecca Kelly G. There's going to be some ecstatic dance in the mornings if you're uh, open to that. It can be very, very releasing because we suppressed so much of this stuff throughout our lives that if we can't use our voice and our bodies in an expressive way, it's going to become a second chakra issue. It's going to, it's going to impact our reproductive organs and our overall health. Um, we're going to be screening... Um, uh, we're going to be screening Aftershock and having a panel discussion with Shawnee Benton Gibson and Omari Maynard, both of whom were featured in the film because um, Omari's wife, who is also Shawnee's daughter, she died as uh, a result of what I would call medical negligence um, due to the color of her skin in the medical system. And that's what Aftershock, the film, is all about. Um, we're going to do a breathwork shop with Sarah Tremoli of Effigy Breath. There is just so much healthy food, healthy community, healthy mm -hmm. conversation in a very, very safe space. No breakout sessions. You're all going to be in the same room together in a very intimate setting, mm -hmm. which I think is very, very important for this work. If you're interested in coming, go to bornfreetwinsbreach.com. Um, register as early as you can because the price will will gradually increase as we get closer and closer to the event. There are a few opportunities available for work exchange for students or people who are otherwise unable to attend financial for financial reasons, um, but everything will be on site at the Omni Hotel in downtown Louisville, a beautiful hotel with some very, very beautiful meals and beautiful spaces that we're all going to be sharing together. I hope to see you in Louisville. The dates are August 8th through the 11th with an opportunity to do either NRP certification or a simulator intensive workshop with one of our instructors on the 12th if you want to stick around. And for those who stick around, maybe there'll be some other goodies along the way. Bornfreetwinsbreach.com. I hope to see you in Louisville. <music>
Um, and uh, the patient, her name was Frau Neufer, and the practitioner was not even a medical doctor. It was her husband, Jacob Neufer. Jacob Neufer, uh, by trade, was a pig gelder. When little baby boy pigs are born for meat, they immediately uh, remove the testicles so that when a they- A gelder? That's the word? I. That's awesome. Go ahead. <laughs> pig gelder. Uh, so that yeah. when they get bigger and they reach the age of sexual maturity, if they still have testicles, then they start making sex hormones like scatol and aldosterone. They don't taste good. It creates something called boar taint. So all oh. the way back then, and we still do it today, when baby boy pigs are born, their testicles are removed. And uh, Jacob Neufer was a pig gelder. And I told this story at a conference of midwives. And, um, you know, I said, look, he obviously had experience caring for wounds. That's a lot of times, you know, we, did, we didn't have the idea of the germ theory, antiseptics. People would die from infection after trying to do a surgery. He obviously had a lot of experience doing these surgeries. Uh, the, the pigs were very valuable. Obviously, if they died or got sick, they would not be um, productive for the, for the trade. But, and uh, he, he must have had all this experience, and he, his, his wife was in labor. The baby was not coming through. They were both at risk of dying, and he asked the authorities for permission to do the cesarean, to, to attempt a cesarean. And generally, up until that point, had it ever been done before, they would kiss the mom goodbye and try to save the baby. And in this case, right. it was the first documented case where they were able to save both. And a midwife came over to me afterwards, and she said, Dr. B, you don't, you don't, you don't understand because she grew up on farms. She's like a good number of those baby pigs are born with undescended testicles. And so it's not just uh -huh. familiarity with incisions. It's familiarity with abdominal incisions needed to go get those testicles gelded and care for the abdominal wound. Um, so there was Frau Neufer having a C-section, but she had several kids afterwards, including a set of twins. And so also the first wow. recorded uh, case of, of VBACs. And this is in the year 1500. Things have evolved. <laughs> we have a lot of ways to, uh, just in the ways that we do our surgeries and help you recover from surgery, uh, to be able to go for a vaginal birth the next time around, you're in way better condition <laughs> than Frau Neufer was. And, yeah, um, yeah. And, and even even going through with a VBAC and, and uh, the abilities to intervene if necessary, um, things have changed a lot. So uh, the idea that you have to fight so hard sometimes to have a birth without surgery is, um, is mind-boggling. So those, those two things come to mind with, um, with what you were just saying previously about, uh, about your client who had three successful VBACs at home after... Um, yeah. After multiple cesareans, including classical incision. Classical. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, these stories happen all the time and I, I've learned how to, how to counsel really, frankly, from Dr. Stu, um, when I've heard him speak, uh, and really you reflect a lot of that same language. I think we're all kind of developing this language together uh, along with some really experienced, respectable, um, mentors that I have in the midwifery community. It's like, listen, I can't tell you the odds. Like, I can't tell you any more than the likelihood of you, you know, placing some sports bets on today's game. Today's the day of giving thanks, everybody. That's why this is a special interview here today, this morning. But, um, you know, people are going to be placing a lot of sports bets. If you were to place a bet and win a ton of money, you would never say, of course I did. But we're, we kind of treat this experience in the trial of labor after C-section, even though we know, even from the data that we have, which isn't great data anyways, it's hard to generalize it. But if it's less than 1%, you would never say, of course I had a uterine rupture. You would say, holy shit, that was lucky in the same way that if you made it big, betting on, it's probably the Lions that are playing today. That's who usually plays on Thanksgiving Day. Um, if you were to bet that they were going to get exactly seven points within the first 10 minutes or some bizarre bet, you can bet on anything in, in Vegas now, you would not look around your, of course I won. Like, But we have this hard time ascertaining risk altogether. Um, so, uh, you know, let's get back to this holistic approach and why childbirth is actually important. You know, these kids are going to end up going on to live, hopefully, long, fruitful lives. What are you seeing in your chiropractor um, experience 
from the standpoint of we're trying we're generalizing here of course a lot of people have vaginal births and the babies have issues a lot of people have c-section the babies do just fine but in general are you noticing any differences between babies who are coming through the birth canal from a chiropractor standpoint or even like an overall health standpoint um, versus those babies <clears throat> who are born by c-section uh yeah, so differences from others and differences for babies. Differences for babies, um, there is this pattern of uh, of difficulty, seemingly. This is anecdotal. I don't have data on it from what we're seeing, but we do have two pediatric chiropractors that practice out of our, our facility, and um, they see babies all day. And um, you know, difficulty latching is one of the is the one of the bigger ones, right? When they come out, and difficulty with digestion. So, um, seemingly, uh, this could be. Yeah, why is up. that? Oh, sorry, you're about to say it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I think you can chalk it up to potentially two things that we can point fingers at again as a potential cause, but I think um, more research is needed. Uh, one of them can be, well, there's a few. Number one, moving through the, the body, through the pelvic bones on the way out during a vaginal birth does seem to trigger um, certain centers of the brain to activate them. Um, that may not be present when you do a cesarean birth. Number two, the, the flora, the bacterial flora, the healthy bacterial flora that babies are exposed to on the way out during a vaginal birth that they can start to colonize that help them with immunity, that help them with digestion um, and other things that we're not even aware of yet that is lost uh, during a vaginal birth. You know, I, I for a while, <laughs> I, I would hear women sort of terrified about one thing about birth. Um, some people are afraid of the pain, the intensity, the tearing, the uh, ring of fire, but um, something that I would hear, you know, in private again and again, uh, is, is it true that I'm going to poop before the baby comes out? And I'm like, maybe, but at, <laughs> at it, it could happen. But at that point, usually nobody cares. First of all, no, nobody around you cares. They're used to seeing it all the time. Um, and you don't care either. You're like in a different state, whether you're medicated or not. Um, and there's no such thing as an unmedicated birth, I realized. Either either we give you medication or you make your own. And the stuff you make is seemingly a lot cooler than mm. the stuff that we can give you. But um, when you're high as a kite on, on your own drugs, you don't even know or care. Um, but it's also, I, I would try to comfort them and saying it's not like big logs of poo. It's just like a sliver. And I, okay. I realized that when the <laughs> the baby moves down past the rectum before coming out, it, it really seems to me as a design to expose the baby to a little bit of fecal matter so that you're exposed to all of that bacteria and that you can start to seed that bacteria oh, and, um, and colonize and grow. I think it's part of the process on, on purpose by design. Um, so those are some of the things that happen during vaginal birth that don't happen during a cesarean birth that may contribute to the observation of uh, babies struggling a bit more with uh, digestion and latching. Um, so you mean it's not also, a sterile process? That means all the sterile gloves and the gown and all that stuff doesn't really matter? Yeah, I mean, I, I, what I, I love to do and I'm trying to do for <laughs> Informed Pregnancy Plus now is uh, just have video of, of different animals, all sorts of different animals in the wild giving birth. Um, and, and just to see how incredibly brilliant they are and, and what they do, uh, with no podcast, no documentaries, no, no classes, no doctor, midwife, doula, sometimes no partner. Um, and they go into labor and they, they seem to know exactly what they're doing. They bring those little babies out and then they turn around and start doing all the neonatal care. They assess the baby. And they, if there's a problem, they realize that there's a problem. There's one elephant video that I show everybody that, uh, she, she, the baby's not breathing. And she realizes this is a problem. She starts to get uh, sort of, you feel the adrenaline pumping in her. And she kicks the baby, wow. probably like how we would normally maybe slap the bum. And uh, she, she she eventually does this thing where she wraps her trunk around the baby's little trunk and yanks on it. And I'm telling you, you can hear the vertebra release. It's like she did this crazy chiropractic like an, an maneuver. adjustment. <laughs> an adjustment. And she opened the airway. And, uh, and all of a sudden the baby's breathing and, and, you know, that's, that's with, 
you've got to send me the, the the link to that. We'll put that in the show notes. That's that's remarkable. Absolutely. I love that. It, that's, yeah. that's called Risky Business. I'll send you a link to it on YouTube, and it's uh, from an elephant reserve in Bali that just caught her. You know, that's they amazing. saw her going to labor, so they filmed it. Um, but uh, to your point, it's uh, she's she's not doing anything to sterilize the situ- situation. She's in in mud, <laughs> you know, and her water breaks, and it's like a river because she's an elephant. Um, and you know, it's just it's it's all there, and the exposure. I I also see this. You know, once the kids are out, we don't let them touch anything. We don't want them to go outside. Oh, you're on the ground, or the, you know, we need exposure to those things to help build up a, a healthy immunity. So, but the first one is during birth and, um, for mothers after cesarean, uh, or vaginal birth, it's a mix, it's a mixed bag. It's kind of what you were saying before. I, I, if I see the strongest correlation is any woman who had a supported birth comes out better off than a woman who feels like she was pushed into things that she didn't want Ah, to do. There's the key. It doesn't matter how you gave birth. It, it, well, it doesn't matter what the procedure was, so to speak, whether it was vaginal or if it was an operative birth, but it was, how was that person supported? And then you have to help put the pieces back together once they, they come into the office. And regardless of that path, you're, you're saying that it actually, the support is more important. I, I think being heard, being in the driver's seat, being you know, at the yeah. end of the day, I always tell my patients, and this took me a long time to learn also. And and like you said, you're still a student. I, I'm a student. I try. I, one of the reasons I love doing podcasts is because I can learn something from everyone. I learn yeah. something from every single one of my patients, from my employees, from my children, from my family, from my, my wife teaches me new things every hour. Um, and so uh, it, it's, it's something that we're always evolving and learning as people and as practitioners. But I learned over time, I tell my patients all the time, I work for you. Yeah, here's this is what I would do, and this is why I would do it. Do you want to? Do you not want to? And sometimes I see people like not want to offend me and say, well, I don't want you to adjust my neck. I, I, I don't care if we adjust your neck. If you want my advice, I think maybe you, this adjustment would be beneficial to you. Here's the risk involved in doing it. And if you don't want to do it, go strong, 100%. We're not going to do it because I work for you. But again, when you get to the hospital and you're wearing that oversized unisex hospital movement with snaps that, you know, one gust of the air conditioning and you're exposed for all to see. And then and then everybody else comes in on these nice scrubs and lab coats. You know, it's like who works for who? It just sets it yeah. up as like you're, you're not in the driver's seat. I find that after a birth, when a woman's in the driver's seat, when she's able to explore her options, make choices, be heard and be an informed part of the decision making, then however, whatever the mode of delivery is, is, is I find the births go better anyway, but whatever the mode of delivery is, the postpartum is going to be a lot better. The physical, mental and spiritual recovery is going to be a lot better. Yeah, not to mention, I mean, you've already touched on a couple of things around the this baby. Um and you do do you do chiropractic uh, chiropractic adjustments on babies too? So I I have uh, in the beginning of our days working in pregnancy and birth, uh, I used to do a lot of uh, babies and toddlers, but we got just way too busy for me to do everything. So I I picked to continue focusing on adults, and I do probably ninety percent pre and postnatal. Um, and then whoever they drag in, we treat the whole family. But uh, we have two doctors who, chiropractors who, um, uh, again, I want to say specialized, but they do have a lot of training, postgraduate training in working with babies and, and kids of all ages. And so they do all of the kids now. But I, I've done a lot of kids in the past. And yeah, we do adjustments on babies. Uh, sometimes people, I, I've done adjustments uh, at births that I've been to. People say, hey, you know, how old was your youngest patient? Like three and a half minutes? I don't know. So uh, uh, sometimes there's a, a real value in doing it then. I think the vision is, thanks to TikTok, that we take the baby's little head and just go, <laughs> snap it. But it's, <laughs> <laughs> baby Sounds like somebody adjusting. breaking a cardboard box in half. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Cracking raw celery. I don't know. But it's... Um, it's uh, it's a very gentle adjustment and a very powerful adjustment that we do on babies. There's not really cracking involved at all. And um, we also do craniosacral therapy for babies, which is a powerful modality, but extremely gentle. And uh, babies have the greatest results sometimes. You'll have a baby that can't latch or can only lay on one side and not nurse on the other side, um, or uh, excessively irritable, can't sleep. 
uh, well, wake themselves up right after they go to sleep, don't digest well. Those things all respond really well, not in every case, but all respond generally really well to the chiropractic and craniosacral for babies, helping the nervous system uh, function at its best. Are you able to grab the baby by the nose and like flip them around like the elephant did and get them breathing a little bit more, a little bit more smoothly? I, have, I haven't tried that. Um, but uh, you know, elephants certainly have the advantage with those long trunks. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, one last topic I want to get into Dr. Berlin is, you know, you've raised four children now they're all in their teens. So you're going to be continuing to parent them and you probably feel like, you know, less now than you did even when they were little, just because that's been the nature of my curious sort of exploration in life so far as a dad now as well of two. Um, and it's, it just seems like it gets more and more complex every day. But I'm curious, as you reflect back on your parenting styles or even what you're seeing emerge in the space around parenting, you know, we have this looming question of permission slips. And you, you alluded to it earlier. You have to raise your hand to go to the bathroom as early as in kindergarten. And it's no different when you're 28 and you're about to have a baby in the hospital. Like, can I get up to go to the bathroom? Like, there's this conditioning where we've outsourced, we've compelled you to outsource your power for so long, such that when you get into the hospital, it seems like a big ask for you to suddenly now be exercising your autonomy. So from the lens of a parent, do you have any advice or have you, have you made it, had any observations in your either interactions with your own kids, your wife, your clientele that might help empower children from an early age, especially young women? Because I've got two little girls. Like, how can we get them to a place where we're not just like throwing caution to the wind, but we want to impress upon them some bodily autonomy? I'll, I'll give you an example. They go to Thanksgiving dinner. And you have to hug and kiss every single family member, even though the kid's like, I don't know, that uncle kind of makes me feel weird or whatever. Um, can you riff on that at all? Like, like, how do we maybe start to impress autonomy in a responsible way as parents from early age? Uh, well, I, I can do my best. Um, I, it's a as big a one, parent, sorry. <laughs> I, I, no, it's fine. As a parent, I'm learning, you know, every minute something new. Um, and, you know, uh, it would be great to have all the experience you have as a parent and then have your first kid. Um, but but you <laughs> don't. You have to learn along the way. One thing I learned is that every kid is different. Some kids need or want different things. Um, and just, just like, by the way, if we're using the analogy, I have patients who love to go to an OBGYN who is the opposite of you. Um, they want the allopathic OBGYN. They want the person totally. who's going to tell them, this is what we're doing. This is when we're doing it. This is how we're doing it. They want the doctor to take the baby out of them. They don't want to have any sort of uh, decision-making involved at all. Um, and that's fine. There's there's plenty of doctors available for you like that. And I think certain kids are like that too. Dad, tell me what to do. I want to know what to do. And of course, you try to instill in those kids um, autonomy and um, the idea of doing the same thing, informed research and making choices. But uh, then there's other kids who can really grasp from even sometimes pretty early ages, the idea that although I'm in a system where I need to follow certain rules, um, there's also areas where I, I can make a difference. I can make a choice and I should be respected in my choice. So um, one, one of the earlier examples that comes into my mind is we have, uh, we have four kids. Our third is a girl who's very feisty and uh, she, even at two years old, like if you would lay out clothing for her and say, Hey, let's get dressed in this clothing. She'd be like, no, I don't want to wear that. Uh, and, <laughs> just defying you every step of the way <laughs> every i'm not wearing that and then she'd pick out the most ridiculous outfits things that don't match and things like that. um and just despite you I, <laughs> <laughs> and she has her own quirky style and so my wife really pointed out like if you try to get her to wear the outfit that you picked out for her you're gonna have you're both gonna have a really rotten day but if you pick out two or three outfits and say, which one of these do you want to wear? You've got it made because she is 
part of the decision making. She's in the in the driver's seat, and you're helping her, and she's going to say, "I want to wear that one." And then, so she wears something quote unquote appropriate, something that I'm ha- happy with and comfortable with, and something that she's ha- happy and comfortable with, and then yeah. she got to choose. Um, and it might be one of those outfits that she would tooth and nail not wear. But if she got to be a part of the decision making, it's sort of like Dale Carnegie uh, ideas. If you come up with the idea, then it's going to be a great idea. But if I give you the idea, it's going to be a bad idea. I can't tell you how many people even, by the way, watch trial of labor with their partners after having had a cesarean birth and and their partners don't understand it, the mental um, aspect, the emotional aspects of it, until they watch it and see other women talk about it. And then it becomes clear to them. So it's, mm-hmm. uh, I don't know if it's, it's how it's delivered to you. Um, look, my kids, uh, <laughs> we grew up, we raise our kids in an Orthodox Jewish household. So there's a lot of rules. And um, some of those rules they love and some of them they don't, don't love. But I think part of the idea of the rules is to create boundaries and within those boundaries, give as much freedom as possible. Um, and I think that is is generally creates the option for a great balance. You know, if if you take those rules and narrow them further or enforce them too rigidly, I think you run into trouble. And um, if you kind of pretend like the rules aren't there, you run into trouble. Combination of having boundaries. Th- these are the three outfits. Which one do you want? Um, still gives you choice, but uh, keeps you within certain safety boundaries. And and um, I think generally that's that's going to work. But every kid is different. Every stage is different. Every stage is challenging, and every stage is rewarding. And the two things I'll say about kids, um, broader to that conversation, are everyone tells you it goes fast, um, and you hear it, and you think you got it until you know one day you're like, which stroller should we buy, and the next day you're like, which college should we? <laughs> look at and um the only thing that happens in between for me was should i oh wow should i start dyeing my beard or not and um that's how quickly it goes that's how quickly it goes um and then the other thing about kids is my kids uh have no social media and i think it's the greatest thing ever and um Mm. they don't particularly miss it because they never had it um and they're not subject to the wild, wild west of uh, of what's being fed to them. Uh, yes. By yeah. controlling voters. And so they get to think for themselves. And uh, in today's day and age, I think that is disappearing. Everything becomes group think, TikTok think. And um, I love the fact that, you know, without that, they have a much better shot of thinking for themselves, making decisions for themselves and advocating for those choices. Yeah. Even when it's me who doesn't want them to take that choice. Yeah, I guess the, I guess, I mean, that's a perfect answer. Honestly, I don't have, I don't have too much to add. I just, I just want people to appreciate that this whole, you know, fight the system, advocate for yourself, blah, 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 is a lot easier if you've already been sort of modeled that by your parents to make responsible decisions, you know, through the lens of informed consent. Um, I don't think they need to know everything. I just think it's it's helpful for them to also see that, hey, it's sometimes okay to push back in a respectful way. And if somebody, if you don't want somebody touching you or or being close to you, even if it's mom or dad, like there's a polite way to say, no, thanks, dad. I, I just need some personal space. Like we're trying to teach them that at, at a young age without making them overly like critical of every single thing in the world, which I think is this kind of delicate balance you're seeing even on social media. So, man, I've got to go start cooking for Thanksgiving dinner, and uh, I'm sure that we're going to stay in touch, and I'm sure we'll do some more interviews, but um, I thank you for some of your time early this morning on the Pacific Coast, and um, do you want to you know, leave anybody else with any important nuggets, as well as maybe <laughs> where they can go to check out some of these, these projects that you've been working on for so long? Not to leave your guest totally hanging, I'll just say that face blindness is the inability of people to recognize other people by their face. It's called <laughs> prosopagnosia. I was born with it. I have a, a, a total case of it, so I don't recognize my wife, my mother, my kids, my patients, anybody by face. 
Uh, and uh, a lot more people have face blindness than know that they have face blindness. I didn't know until I was 39 years old. Finding out changed my life. So if you find yourself in positions where like uh, people come up to you and start talking to you as if you know them and it takes you a while to figure out who they are, go check out prosopagnosia or face blindness. Um, that's my, Elliot, my Elliot, little... you get freaked out in the mirror when you wake up in the morning? <laughs> <laughs> only well, just because it's me, but only uh, after a haircut. Uh, if I I let my uh, my time, I, I try to spend every minute judiciously, and so I let my hair grow until I can't recognize myself, and then I get a haircut. And then when I see myself in the mirror right after that transformation, a lot of times it is like a "Who the heck is that?" And then I'm like, "Oh, it's me." No, it's more like this. It's like, "Holy shit, you're handsome." That's probably what you say. In the morning. <laughs> uh, and then I wake up. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, to find things online in terms of us, we just, you know, if you're in Los Angeles, drberlin.com is where you can find out about all the services we offer. Um, but on the broader scale, just like you, Nathan, uh, we're, we're on the same team. We're learning from each other. We're, we're pieces of the same puzzle. When all the pieces are in place, the, the people uh, are empowered and our pieces of that puzzle are the Informed Pregnancy blog, the Informed Podca uh, Pregnancy podcast, and Informed Pregnancy Plus, the new streaming service. Uh, it's at informedpregnancy.tv or on apps at Android, Apple, and Roku. Oh, it's an app. It's an app in and of itself. That's amazing. Yes, you can watch on the wow. big screen. It's sort of just like uh, Netflix for, for growing families. Wow. And we just added some very cool stuff on there. We have... I'm really excited about Natalie Headings. She's uh, in Alaska, and she's a brilliant uh, pelvic floor specialist. And she has just the most – she's like the girl next door who knows everything, though, like super smart girl next door. And she yeah, really yeah. describes what the pelvic floor anatomy is and normal function and dysfunction and how to recognize certain types of dysfunction, even remedies that you can do at home. Uh, that's under our courses and workshop section. We have meditations on there. Uh, for all sorts of different things, physical fitness, workouts, yoga, belly dance for birth. Uh, uh, and we're constantly adding. We're trying to make it easy for you. Natalie Heading, we'll have to put a link to her work as well. Um, holistic Pelvic Coaching, by any chance, is that her? Yes, yes. Okay, She's great. We'll put a link to her work as well. Wonderful. She seems like a like a very approachable, like blonde woman who lives next door. That's exactly right. You, you said it already. She's a, yeah. she's a girl next door, but she's so so brilliant. Super and good bit. yeah, wow. Okay, and just can really give the information in a way that can be understood, received, and actionable. Why don't you put me in touch with her? Maybe we'll bring her on for a, a follow up episode. Now that we're we're you know talking about her work, plus she lives in Alaska. People that live in Alaska yeah. have a very different way of living life, which is pretty amazing. Um, yeah, they age slower because it's so freaking cold. I, <laughs> I think you're right. They're like they're in like cryotherapy all day, every day, for <laughs> all the day, twenty four hours a day. That's amazing. Um, Doctor Berlin, thank you. We will send everybody your way. I'm going to go download the Informed Pregnancy Plus app uh tonight probably and start digging into some of natalie's stuff that is a, a really beautiful um beautiful gift it's sort of like the gaia for 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 pregnancy it's like the gaia totally. network yes. yeah um thank you so much my friend i appreciate seeing Thanks, you Doc. and I we will uh, have to stay yeah we'll have to stay in touch likewise likewise to you thank you for doing this work out in la mm -hmm.